Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. When the original Star Wars came out, I think it was 1977, uh, we went and saw the show. I think my dad took me to see it, as I recall, four times. And I'm, I'm old enough to, to have seen it in the theater and to kind of remember the experience of waiting in line. Back then, when that movie came out, there were there were lines around buildings. It was such a such a big deal when that thing was released, and it was it was one of my earliest memories, significant memories of just spending time with my dad. And I remember one thing in particular, where we were driving home after seeing it. And like I said, as I recall, he took me to see it four times. That's how I remember this. And we were driving home one time, and I remember tr- I wanted to I wanted to hear the theme song again. I wanted to remember how it goes, da, na, 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 that whole thing. And I remember distinctly asking my dad as we were driving home to to hum it to me or to sing it to me because I couldn't remember it, and I loved it so much. I wanted to remember. Anyway, so it was that experience of going to see Star Wars was one of those things I remember, once again, spending time with my dad early on, and then you know, going and, and seeing it together several times. And so when it, when it was re-released in the 90s, I actually called him up and I said, hey, we got to go see Star Wars again in the theater since it's, since it's out. And then I thought, and I'm going to take my daughter now, and we're going to go, so the three of us see it together. Now, my daughter was was very young, I don't know, four or five at the time, whenever they re-released them, I don't remember. And she didn't, I don't know that she appreciated it quite as much as I did when I was a little kid. And, but a few years later, I had a son who then, that's something that, that he and I were able to connect on over time. Because he, once he discovered Star Wars, it became a huge deal. For him, he and he loves pretty much all things Star Wars. So, when the Clone Wars animations came out, we watched them. We would see all the we'd see the movies together, and then we'd watch all the different TV series that came on. And so, then a couple years ago, I don't remember when it was exactly, but when the Mandalorian came out, of course, he and I had to start watching the Mandalorian together. <clears throat> so we. We've watched a bunch of these episodes, and then all of a sudden, on one of these episodes, there's Carl Weathers. <laughs> I see Carl Weathers in The Mandalorian. Now, Carl Weathers is part of the the Star Wars universe. Anyway, it just was kind of kind of such a strange thing to see him. Now, Carl Weathers, of course, is is part. It, 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 we lost him this last week. And it's significant to talk about, I think, because he was an important part of Western culture because of a couple of these roles that he played. And one in particular, of course, everybody knows, he was Apollo Creed in Rocky. And that that character was just so amazing. This kind of a little bit arrogant, boisterous, a little bit Muhammad Ali esque in that he just had the just this massive charisma. Anyway, they what what a great character Apollo Creed, and and Rocky though had come out a year or so before Star Wars did, and I wasn't, and Rocky was something for a, a, I guess I would have been six or seven at that point was would have been way over you know the deepness of it and whatever, I, I wouldn't have, I was too young to connect with something like that. So I don't, my, uh, I don't really remember that. And that's not how Carl Weathers was introduced to me. Carl Weathers is one of my favorite actors because of something completely different. Because when I first was introduced to him as an actor, was he was in another movie called Force 10 from Navarone. 
And I, to this day, one of my favorite movies of all time. And I go back and watch it now as an older person. And it's a little, there are some, it's a little bit silly in parts where you can see it. The production was not spectacular, but I still love it. And it had some big names in it. I mean, Harrison Ford is in it. Robert Shaw is in it. So, I mean, and, and it, it was a, it was a, the, the, and the storyline is just, I actually have an episode, I think 150, 200 episodes back where I actually talk about that movie. It's one of my favorites. But but Carl Weathers <coughs> played this character named Sergeant Weaver. And this came out again a couple years after Rocky. But he was kind of a little bit had that Apollo Creed energy in this in this character. But he but he was a very different character. It, what he was is he was part of the United States Medical Corps or something like that. And, 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 and in the story, he basically has been captured by the military police outside of this, this, air, this airstrip. And you have these commandos that, are, that, are, that consist of Harrison Ford and and Robert Shaw and a bunch of other people that are breaking into this airfield to, to basically steal a plane to go run this allied mission. And they're doing it under the cover of dark. So nobody, because all the other missions out of this area had been shot down. So they're doing it with no, so they're sneaking into the airfield, cutting the fence, going in. These military police catch them as they're trying to break into the airfield. And they've, and, and Carl Weathers, Sergeant Weaver is sitting in this Jeep because he's been arrested by the military police. The military police get out of the Jeep and they go try to fight Harrison Ford and his team to, to, uh, as they're trying to steal this plane. And then Carl Weathers, who is under arrest and he's got a, one of these military police sitting in the back of this Jeep watching this big brawl, <laughs> finally reaches over, punches this guy, this military policeman, and then runs over and just jumps in the middle of this fight and just starts beating up people. It's so it's so great. And in this movie, he has this he he's a little bit like comic relief. Even though it's not a funny part, he's a little bit like the Shakespearean chorus where he's that extra guy that's kind of in and out of the story and and commenting on it and it, he's just he was just awesome. If you ever get a chance to see Force 10, 10 from Navarone, watch it for the sole purpose of seeing Carl Weathers at his best. And it was just, it, it, anyway, it's so much fun. And so, so seeing him, watch, you know, losing him this last week and thinking about him, thinking back to what, how much I loved him when I first saw that movie. And then, of course, later on, all, you know, then you get introduced to Rocky and then you, you see really, really what put him on the map, which was as Apollo Creed in, in the Rocky films. Now, his, his rise to fame and becoming an actor, it's interesting how these pieces fell into place for him to do what he did. When he was a kid, when he was in, I think it was sixth grade, it was the first time he ever acted. He was just in some play that is one of his teachers wrote or something. And he talks about this, how, how he was on the stage and he remembers delivering a line or doing whatever it was. And then he remembers the applause and he just thought, oh my gosh, I want this <laughs> to, to get up in front of an audience and then do this acting thing and then people applaud and he just wanted more and more of that. So, so this became something that he really wanted in his life. And he had, I talk about these things every day where you have these moments that, that change you. And that was one of them for him. He's a six year old kid. He's in this play and, and he hears applause and it just changes him. Even at that young age saying, I'm, focused on this. But the other thing though, was that he was a very athletic kid. He was a big kid. And, you know, Carl Weathers is, is six, two. So in the world of Hollywood, where a lot of your, 
male leads are under six feet tall, sometimes quite a bit under six feet tall. I, th- I think Sylvester Stallone is 5'10". Excuse me. Carl Weathers is 6'2". He's a huge dude. And, and so because he was so big and athletic, he naturally gravitated towards, uh, towards sports. And one of the things he did was he, he played football. And so he, when he went to college... He was in, he played, he played um, I think it was defensive end for San Diego State University. And I think they won some, I, I think they had some, won some championship or something that year. That, but anyway, he, he, or one of the years he was there. Anyway, so he was pretty good. He was a good ball player and he loved playing football. But the entire time also while he's playing football, he's also studying acting and becoming better at it. And, and, and he was a little bit embarrassed by it because people on the, that were these, you know, strong, powerful, big guys on, these, on the football team would kind of poke fun at the fact that he was an actor. And so he, he would kind of hide that, although he still loved it and he kept doing it. But his dream then became playing professional football. Well, in 1970, in the 1970 draft, he was not drafted. So he was a walk-on for the Oakland Raiders and actually made it onto the Oakland Raiders football team and played a little bit that season. And I think they won the AFC championship that year. I don't remember. I'm going to get some of this stuff wrong. But I mean, he was part of a pretty significant team. And at the time, John Madden, who everybody knows who John Madden is, I mean, that ended up, he ended up being one of the biggest football uh, video games. His name Madden after him. You know, he's this super famous coach. So anyway, so Carl Weathers plays uh, for a season for the Oakland Raiders. The next year, he's back on the team and he plays a couple of games and then he's called into the coach's office and he's told to bring his playbook. And that is a little bit like telling somebody to clean out their desk. (laughs) And he knows what's coming. And he goes in to the head coach's office with John Madden and, and they ask him for his playbook. And, and it's so funny, this story, because apparently what John Madden said to Carl Weathers is, you know, you're just too sensitive, which is such a strange, <laughs> such a funny thing to say to somebody. But anyway, he was cut from the team. And then he went and tried to play in, uh, he went to try to play in, a Canadian league. And I think he played there for a year or two, but not a really illustrious career. Nothing really spectacular happened. No big stats that anybody's aware of. And, and then that ended. And, and then of course, once that NFL career didn't work out and of course the Canadian one, nothing really big came from it. What does he do? He goes back to what he always really truly loved which was acting. And y- you, you look back at moments like this that, that to some of us would consider real setbacks. You know, he's trying to get in the NFL. He makes it onto a team, trying to prove himself, and then he's cut. And just imagine the devastation, the devastation when you... you for years and years and years, you'd played football and you wanted to be a great football player and you wanted to play in the NFL and you wanted to have this big career as a professional football player and then you're cut. And just, it, it, I, and we've all had experiences like that. The devastation that comes when your dream, this thing, you, you know, getting fired from a job. I mean, it's just getting rejected in one way or the other. It's awful. It's an awful, awful feeling. But if that hadn't happened, we might not even know who he is today. He might not have had that career that we all know him for today if he hadn't have been cut. And it's so interesting how often when I talk about these things that I call the thick and mystic moment where your life is going this way and then suddenly it's going this way, you're, you're 
playing professional football, you're on the Oakland Raiders, everything's looking bright and exciting, and you're you're doing everything that you dreamed of, and then boom, that fast John Madden cuts you, tells you you're too sensitive, and you're out. Now what? The devastation, humiliation, the ugly feelings that come with all that stuff, and then it ends up being the thing that causes you to go do what he sh- probably should have been doing all along pursuing this other thing that he was so good at and that he loved so much. And it's funny when you when you hear the story of how he made it into the movie Rocky because he'd done a couple of bit parts and things before auditioning for Rocky, but he was nobody. And also Sylvester Stallone was nobody. And as a matter of fact, if you don't know the story, Sylvester Stallone had written Rocky inside of just a few days out of kind of desperation, trying to make some money. If he could write a good script, sell it to a studio, and then, and then him play the Rocky character. That was his dream or his vision with that. And it, 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 as the story goes, he had 150 bucks in the bank, something like that was broke, couldn't pay his rent, and he, he, out of desperation, tries to make something happen like this. His friend, believe it or not, Henry Winkler, the Fonz, at the time was the Fonz, and he was on his second or third season of Happy Days, and he's this huge star at this point. Everybody knows who the Fonz is. Takes his script for him to, I don't know, to some ABC TV or somebody, but anyway, to some producers who love the script, love, love the script and want to buy it. They got as high as offering something like $260,000 for the script to Rocky, but they didn't want Sylvester Stallone in it. And so Sylvester Stallone with no money in the bank said, no, no, because he wanted it. He knew that once, if he sold it, after he'd received the money and after the money was gone, he would have kicked himself. Why didn't he stick to it? This is his baby. He wanted, if he's going to lose, he wanted to lose on his terms. So amazingly, it took him a while, but they finally agreed. Some studio agreed to take in on the script, giving him a budget, and letting him make this movie, and letting him star in it. Okay, so this is where it gets to Carl Weathers, and this is what's such a funny story. When they were auditioning all the different people for the Apollo Creed part, they actually looked at professional boxers. They really wanted to get people that knew what they were doing in the ring, and they'd auditioned all these, they'd auditioned a lot of actors, they'd looked at a lot of professional boxers, hoping they could find somebody that was a boxer that could also act, And they weren't finding anybody. And apparently, Carl Weathers, they brought him in at the 11th hour. You know, they'd they'd auditioned all these different people. According to the, when Carl Weathers tells a story, he says that his agent said that they didn't even really want to, to, to visit with him. (laughs) He was not anywhere near there because he wasn't a name there was nothing special about him and they weren't all that interested in having him audition, but somehow he managed to get himself this audition with this in this movie. And as he, what happens is he walks in, he's, he has seen the script. They ha- they gave him the whole script uh, ahead of time. And so he had managed to read this and he thought, I desperately, this is me. I want to be in this movie so bad. I, this is totally me. He walks into this audition, like a lot of people are in these moments, super nervous, especially when you really, really want it. And he goes into this audition, and Sylvester Stallone is actually at the audition. And the they say, okay, Carl, you're going to be reading the part with the, the script writer, who's Sylvester Stallone. That's how he was introduced, as the script writer. So Sylvester Stallone's sitting there at a table and he starts reading the lines and then Carl Weathers is reading the the Apollo Creed lines back. 
And having been in a few of these auditions myself, gone through this experience, you you can kind of sense when you're not getting it. And when it doesn't feel right, like it's just, you're just not getting it somehow. It doesn't feel like you're delivering it the way you need to. And a lot of people early on, you'll just start making excuses for yourself. Like, you know, I could do better. I can do better, which is kind of a useless thing to do. (laughs) But except for this time, it was so interesting how this happened. So he, so Apollo Creed or not Apollo, but Carl Weathers is reading this script reading these lines opposite Sylvester Stallone, who's the writer of this movie that he's auditioning for. He tries delivering these lines, doesn't feel like he did a very good job. And then basically says, Hey, you know what I could do? I could do a lot better with these lines. I could do a lot better if I could do them with an actual actor, you know, somebody that knew how to act, not knowing that the person he's actually doing the lines with is not just the writer, but he's also going to be the lead in the movie, Sylvester Stallone. And, and when you hear Sylvester Stallone talk about this, that, that amazingly was what pushed Carl Weathers over the edge on getting the part was because of his absolute arrogance, this attitude that he had. And Sylvester Stallone looks at this and goes, this is, this is the kind of arrogant attitude that we need for this character, for this Apollo Creed. And if you've ever, if you've watched the movies, that is it. It's the, it's the Muhammad Ali attitude of nobody can beat me. I'm the best. I'm the best, you know, that kind of thing. And, and that was the, the energy that Carl Weathers had when he had this audition. Hey, I could do so much better if you give me an actual actor. And, and just this dismissive attitude towards this other thing, this other person. And that's what got him the part. Amazing, amazing thing. It was su- it's such a great story. And then, of course, he gets the part of Apollo Creed, and and then the rest is, as they say, history. And ended up being in four Rocky movies, four of them. And they were all fun. All of them were fun. And he was great in all of them. Just And he had that same kind of attitude. And he's the one, you know, not only did he introduce us to this this beautiful character but you know he's the guy that that was the first one that kind of brought the eye of the tiger that theme to the world because he was trying to get rocky to get the eye of the tiger back and now everybody knows that that line you know and he's the one that delivered that stuff to us originally Th- those movies were such a powerful part of the culture and i wanted to there, there was something interesting about them because the first the first movie was about going the distance. You know, there's this famous part in in that show where Rocky is talking to Adrian, and he he doesn't he's not worried about winning the fight. All he wants to do is go the distance. I just, and, and he talks about this in the movie. I think I have another show, a hundred shows back where I talk about this moment. And it's such a beautiful thing because he's telling Adrian when that last bell goes after the end of the 15th round, he just wants to still be on his feet because nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. And it's such a wonderful view into humanity of I just want to still be standing. I just want to be standing when it's over. And when it moves into Rocky II, that theme is what leads to what I think is that it is the parallel moment in Rocky II, but then it was delivered by Carl Weathers or, or Apollo Creed. Because when they're talking and arguing about whether or not he, Apollo Creed wants a rematch. And the reason he wants a rematch is because he didn't, it was, it was a, it was a decision. It wasn't a knockout. It was the judges deciding his trainer doesn't want him to have a rematch. And the reason is he says, I saw you give that man a beating like I've never seen before. And he kept coming at you. (laughs) 
And that was the, you know, that's what Rocky wanted in the first movie. I just want to still be standing. Whatever, whatever beating I get, I still want to be standing up when it's over. So that bleeds into the second movie where he makes that comment. But, but Carl Weathers, and this is the line that to me stands out so much in Rocky too, was Carl Weathers says, I won, but I didn't beat him. What a, what an amazing theme. What a powerful thing to think about. Because when you look at something like a boxing match, when you get to the end of the match and you've gone through all the rounds and nobody was knocked out, then it's just some judges and their decision, you know, their, their, kind of vision of what happened in the fight and who fought better. And it's and it's kind of an unfulfilling moment at the end of a fight like that where where it's a, a decision by the judges what their scorecard says about who won the fight. You, and I don't think anybody really wants to win that way because it's kind of this indecisive thing. It doesn't feel like you won because it's it's these these people's view on who did better. And, and and it just doesn't feel right at that moment, and that's where that's where this whole this incredible thought was that I think so many people, so many of us can relate to. I won, but I didn't beat him. I remember when I was a young guy, we had a we I played church basketball, and we were an okay team. Actually, we had a couple of guys on the team a couple of years that were amazing players, and so. But part of the thing was you would you'd play a, bunch, a series of games, and then the people that the teams that did the best would then go on, and they'd have these little championship at the end. If you won enough games, you'd make it into the championship. I remember one of these games where because it's church basketball, and so it's a little little bit disorganized. It's not quite the regimented thing that you have in in you know leagues. And I remember this one particular game, we got there and we had all of our guys, I don't know, we had six or seven guys that were there to play. And the other team, I think only three people showed up or something like that. And we won that game before it even started because they forfeited because they didn't have enough players. And so you get a W, you win the game, but that's awful. You don't want to win that way. You don't, you don't want to, that's not a way to win. It's kind of like, like Apollo Creed said, I won, but I didn't beat him. There's this, there's this kind of, there's this feeling that you want. I want to actually win the game. I don't want it to get handed to me. I want to actually work for it. I want to, des- I want to deserve it. I don't want it handed to me because somebody felt bad for me or because somebody didn't, uh, because the other team didn't show up. You know, whatever it happens to be, I don't want to win that way. I want to win because I actually put in the effort. And that really is that theme that was introduced in that movie. And it, it, it's kind of interesting because when you look at getting back to Carl Weathers, one of the reasons that he was able to get that part, yes, he had that kind of funny thing with Sylvester Stallone in the audition, but there was more to him. And he talks about this later, that one of the reasons he was so good that he was able to work so well in that movie and some of the other movies he was in was interestingly because of his football career. And he talks about one thing that did it and it was the word discipline. He says, because when you're a professional football player and even on a college level, you have to be disciplined you have to live a certain way. You have to get to bed at a certain time. You got to get up at a certain time. You've got to live your life a certain way. You got to eat certain food. You got to have a certain exercise regimen. You have to do all these different things to win, to deserve it, to be better than the other guy. 
discipline. And he says he, he brought that attitude to that role. So all the things he had to do to get in shape and to be this, this, you know, this real, truly amazing human specimen that he was in those movies, he had to have that type of lifestyle. He had to have that ability to be super mega disciplined physically to be able to do it. And that's such an important thing for, for all of us to, to learn that there's real value in that ability to be disciplined. And then it gets you back to that line. I won, but I didn't beat him. So often, not just winning, but beating the competition is about our ability to be disciplined. So when those opportunities come in for, are, appear before us or they, they fall in our laps or whatever they happen to be, that we're ready for them, that we've worked that we've put in the energy, we've put in the effort, we've done the work that needs to be done to get us ready for when the opportunity arises, we are ready to rise to the challenge. And so much of that gets back to this whole idea of discipline. And what is discipline? It ties into something I talk about here almost uh, all the time, which is commitment. Commitment is following through with a decision even when you don't feel like it anymore. One of the things that I started doing, almost it's been... Well, what is this? This show is 230 something. I don't know what, what number this is. But I had to become disciplined to do this every single day. There have been a lot of days in the last 230 some odd days where I did not have time to do this. I didn't have the, the energy. I didn't have the... This is one of the reasons I usually get up at 3.30 in the morning. I have to have discipline to force myself to do that. To get up that early in the morning to make this work to manage to get something out every single day. There's discipline involved with it. And so often success or actually achieving something ties back to that word. And in the end, that very thing is what takes a guy like Carl Weathers and pushes him over the edge, pushes him over the top because he brings to the table, not just his talents and abilities, but his discipline And when we can make a commitment in our life to do something, whatever that happens to be, and then again, like I said, follow through, even when you don't feel like it anymore. And in order to do that, you need to have the discipline that when you don't feel like doing something anymore, you still do it. You put yourself in that mindset, you put yourself in that physical space, whatever it happens to be, and you just do it. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. <laughs>